participated in making this possible, the lay support group and the monks and nuns that have taken on administrative or duties during this retreat, greatly appreciated. And the uh, back in the sala now, all freshly painted clean, the brand new kitchen and uh, all of that is, these are very much uh, appreciated by all of us. The uh, Homs Mendicant life has this kind of magic to it, of, of support and uh, blessings that, that come to us. We always reflect that our life is dependent on, uh, on alms, on the goodness of others. And this is very important in the, in the monastic form. That's the point of being an alms mendicant. You're putting yourself out on the edge into that dangerous place of no security. So it seems like we can take a lot for granted here in this well-supported monastery and so forth, but I advise you not to take it for granted. Don't think you deserve it, or that anyone should offer you food to at any time whatsoever. We always take it as a blessing when you go through the f to collect the food. See it say like a surprise. Somebody offered, cared enough to offer food today, rather than thinking, "Oh well, they didn't give me what I want," or. or or just not notice, just take it for granted. And so the, the, the point of being a samana, an alms mendicant, what is, the, what is the purpose of it? Why did the Buddha establish uh, the Sangha as an alms mendicant order? Because <coughs> it's always a risk, isn't it? You're living in a time where people want certitude security of every sort. Uh, you know, the elections coming up next month here in Britain, you hear the politicians offering all kinds of certainties about lower taxes and more benefits and promises to the, uh, just to attract votes. Because that's what people want. We want to feel, I've got, you know, I'm guaranteed a meal every day, shelter, everything. What, who will take care of me when I get old? What's going to happen? All the unknowns. This thing. Will my pension be enough to take care of me when I'm old and gray and alone? And there's so much to worry about and uh, about the future, even when you're young. But the um, alms mendicant is an you know, we're taking that, we want to see that, the way our mind is conditioned to create anxiety and worry, longing for security, certitude. 
and uh, and this is the you know the desire of the mind, the ignorance of the mind, wanting certainty, wanting a guarantee, and that the the whole spiritual endeavor is all about uncertainty. It's the don't know practice, you know, rather than thinking if I practice, if I become a monk or a nun, will I get? We guarantee that I get enlightened, and <laughs> and uh, how long does it take? And is there a shortcut? And people ask me, what is the shortcut to enlightenment? <coughs> And I remember back in the, before I became one, when I was in Berkeley, the the LSD scene was starting in uh, Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, <laughs> and all the rumors uh, in Berkeley you hear about this wonderful drug that you could take and get enlightened, it cost only five dollars. <laughs> and I'd been in, in the, doing a a uh, graduate uh, MA degree in uh, in South Asian area studies. And so I had in the University of California, they had, if you're a graduate student, you get a private desk. And I had this lovely desk up on the, in the stacks in the library where they had these skylights and all the books on religion were on this, on the ninth tier, you see. So I had this desk with this Skylight above me, and uh, all these the books are, you know, very good. Li University of California has a very good library, so you know, they had uh, all these books on India and yoga and and uh, Vedanta, Buddhism, everything. And so I'd be fascinated with all these books, you know, looking at pictures of yogis. Uh, taken f uh, photographs taken of yogis in, in, in covered in ashes or hanging upside down from trees and, and uh, thinking of all this uh, spiritual life, you know, it's hard work, you know, torturing yourself, learning to stand on one foot for, for 40 years to get enlightened. Uh, <coughs> and even the Buddhist monk, the Buddha wasn't into asceticism. But being celibate, being having to take on a, a monastic discipline, all that kind of, all those rules and precepts. So LSD, you know, five dollars. Even then, that wasn't very much money. And then uh, you, you you go over to Haight Ashbury, buy a tab of LSD, five bucks, whammo. Enlightenment, and so that was that's very much an American mindset. Instant, you know, no, don't have to suffer or be patient or do anything, but just buy it, you know, at a at the corner drugstore. <laughs> that's what they call them in American drugstores. That sounds funny here, doesn't it? <coughs> and. Uh, of course, I knew that that wouldn't be it. But I mean, the, there was the, the idea of of uh, a lifetime of commitment to a spiritual path was was a, a grand idea. But there was also something that would like to have a, have a, a you know have a shortcut, get instant enlightenment, even if it was induced through a chemical. But anyway, I, I gave up on that idea and pursued, fortunately, uh, I left the, the scene before I got involved too much in it and uh, went off to Asia and became a monk. So, it was in 1966 I became a Samanera in Thailand. But the, the thing that impressed me, being a, like a foreigner in Thailand, was uh, something that I, you know, I never took it for granted. I never felt that I was quite 
you know, when I first went there, I didn't even know if they'd accept me. You know, what would Thai Buddhists, would they want to accept a foreigner in a monastery? <coughs> Could they be bothered with a, with, a, with a foreigner? And so I was quite impressed when they were, you know, I was very warmly received. And, and all my monastic life in Thailand was, you know, greatly much appreciated because I was so well uh, supported and encouraged and respected uh, by uh, almost the whole country. You know, so that everything, you know, is getting this tremendous support for the holy life, <coughs> which would surprise me. I didn't, <coughs> you know, I was never asked for any money or anything whatsoever. Once I became a, a summoner. So it was all, you know, this tremendous generosity directed towards me, towards this foreign uh, creature, to support the practice of the holy life. And so this always I felt in uh, gratitude for. I never, I never took it for granted or, or just, uh, you know, ignored the fact. This was a contemplation of why should these people bother to take an interest in a foreigner? Somebody that comes from outside their own society, can't even speak their own language, can't, you know, big and clumsy, like a bull in a china shop. You know, the Thai monastery, everybody moves kind of like liquid in here with this uncoordinated big American gawky monk. So it was, uh, you know, I felt very self-conscious a lot of the time and, and uh, but but there was no kind, I've never detected aversion, or there's always an eagerness and, uh, and a, uh, a tremendous eagerness uh, to support those interested in the holy life. Well, making that a reflection brought forth in me a lot of gratitude, you know, because uh, I wasn't expecting it, or didn't e you know? wasn't uh, didn't demand it, or expect it at all. That it would just happen like that. So, in uh, the life of a samana based on alms, and here in England also, the, the the support and and that that we get here is incredible. All because there's this tremendous willingness to to uh, give us every opportunity for enlightenment. Now, most of your parents don't even want you to be enlightened, do they? They'd rather you were ignorant and not a monk or a nun. <coughs> so, so, you know, they'd like to get married and have family and make lots of money and things like this. But, but this is, you know, the support and the alms offered to us as samana is, is the purpose is for us to encourage us, to move us, to give us every opportunity, every occasion for uh, practice. Developing, reflecting, understanding, insight, into the, the truth or the Dhamma. So it is a, a magnificent opportunity, you know, it's, uh, it's, and it's rare, you know, that, that people have such an opportunity at this time, especially in, in the Western world, where Buddhist monasteries are few. So by reflecting in this way, it it's always motivated me never to take the life for granted or to misuse it, but to really, uh, you know, by reflecting this way, it gives me that motivation, that determination 
to keep going because in anything you do in life, whether you're a samana or a lay person or whatever, uh, you know, the, the emotional world of our personalities, our individual karmas are pretty fraught. You know, they go up and down and you go through, you know, inspiration and and uh, disillusionment and happiness and suffering, success and failure. Same thing happens in the monastic life. You know, it's a, it can be inspired, it can get really boring, you can become disillusioned, fed up, and uh, with yourself, with the community, with Buddhism, whatever, the, whatever you attach to and whatever you find that inspires you will eventually take you to the other side, to disillusionment. Inspiration is a, is a great gift, something that, that really, you know, gives us that momentum, that a sudden faith or a sudden real interest in something that will uh, get us motivated to move, to, to commit, to do something. But to depend on inspiration as a, as a, as a means for practice is, is going to be, you know, you're not, it doesn't last that long. It's, it's just a, like the initial impetus. So we have to develop something beyond inspiration, which is uh, wisdom. Developing insight, wisdom, by examining, reflecting on the way things are. Not on inspiration. Inspiration is is based on more on the ideal world of attaining, achieving, becoming. You know, and based on the, you, you know, if you want inspi- want to get inspired, you have to use superlative terms. You have to talk in hyperbole and, and about ultimate things, about ultimate love and freedom and, and all the best and purity and goodness. But in the daily life of any individual human being, it's, it isn't a superlative experience, is it? It's like this. You know, it's a, there's moments where one feels inspired, and then, and then one can be upset, or the weather might turn cold, and we feel depressed, or we feel frustrated. Just the the convention itself, the monastic conventions, can be very frustrating to us. The limitations they place on us, and the the problems that seem to to arise out of the containment, out of the discipline, out of the uh, restriction, the boundaries of Buddhist monasticism. We can endlessly make problems about that. <coughs> but the aim of it all is it not to, to just uh, kind of passively surrender and and this kind of go along with everything uh, in, through passivity, but it means a real determination to really look at what's happening in your in yourself. You know, use every opportunity, no matter what state of mind you're in or what's happening, whether inspired or depressed or bored or whatever your mental experience of the present might be, the freedom from that is through reflecting on it, recognizing it for what it is. So enlightenment is instant. You know, it's it's as simple as that, to really trust in that ability to observe. In uh, just the the existential situation of being an individual entity on this in this solar system, there's the the subject object reality, isn't it? The the subject 
you know, this, you know, me experiencing this. What's happening to me? Uh, what I'm seeing or hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or feeling. And if that's interpreted always from the me, from the self-view, then it is, uh, you know, takes one to anxiety, fear, uh, despair. On the negative side, we can, uh, you know, uh, we have a lot of hope that eventually I'll get over my problems, solve all my problems, and realize the truth and be free from all ignorance. There's hope and expectation, anticipation, fear and dread. There's a sense of lack in our lives as a personality, as a person. You know, I never felt complete. I always felt there's something missing in me. I used to fear, you know, I used to think it was only me. Maybe I was born kind of with a, not a full deck of cards or a screw loose or something, <laughs> something missing. Uh, because there was a, this sense of incompleteness, of some lack, as a person. So then, on a personal level, one was always trying to find completion through succeeding, through relationships with others, through belonging, through all kinds of other things out there, trying to find that out there which would make me feel good and secure and safe making lots of money, then I'd feel much more secure if I had, you know, a million pounds in the bank. Uh, if I had the right relationship with somebody, you know, that would I'd feel complete and whole through that relationship, through owning my own house or having a guaranteed uh, profession, having a pension. But even with all the guarantees possible on that, on the level of, you know, on the, the personal demands, expectations, even when you get, you know, the best of the best, but still, the, the problem is still there. Because the personality is not, you know, is, it's very, it's based on ignorance, on not understanding. Our personalities are developed out of avicca, not out of panya. How many of you developed your personalities out of wisdom, out of right understanding, right intention? Or do we just develop the way we are through, through default, you know, getting born into the particular family and society that we were born into and the opportunities and the experiences that, that came through that? Your sense of your self-worth, your value, your self-image is so dependent on these, on these conditions. But the, so on the objective level, we're always looking for security from outside. You know, finding it through something out there. That's how the person, at least that's how my personality works. It's my personality is like that. But there's something beyond the personality. The per is the personality the subject of this moment? Me, uh, Ajahn Sumedho, am, am I, as a person, is my personality the real subject? Or what is the real subject right now at this very moment? The real subjective reality And then your, your personality will stop when you ask yourself that question. There's no person, but there is awareness, isn't it? That awareness, which isn't personal. You know, I didn't, it's not culturally conditioned or created through experience or through uh, karma or through, you know, good uh, success or failure. And that pure awareness then 
is the, is the ability, when we recognize and value that pure awareness, the pure reflective ability, awakened attention here and now, before my personality comes into the act. And so that is an, you know, that's to be recognized. And that knowing, that, that awareness, you know, that isn't distorted through personal perception. Immediately I get into what I like as a person, what I don't like, what I, what I think should be or shouldn't be, and good, bad, right, and wrong. Then then I experience life through my biases, through my prejudices, through my preferences, through the sense of myself as a person. But if I really trust in the awareness, that's no, there's no person there. But it's cer certainly intelligent, bright, perfect. And then the, then the conditioned world can be seen in terms of Dhamma. The personality then is witnessed to, it's recognized. Me as a person comes and goes and changes, you know, and my preferences, my likes and dislikes, fears and desires and so forth are seen from that perspective, pure awareness. Not judged in, I mean, it's, if I start judging myself, I'm back in my personal scenario, my personal agenda. My personality has a lot of views and opinions about everything and preferences and judgments. You know, they all kind of, this is good and that isn't any good and this is right and that's not, and that's wrong and, and uh, I like this but I don't like that. This is what should be, and it shouldn't be like that, and uh, and on like that. Then it, I'm passing judgment. You know, if I have bad thought, a bad feeling, bad mood, then I, on a personal level, I can, this is a bad mood. I shouldn't have. Uh, this is a bad mood, and I'm being very selfish, and I shouldn't be. I've got to get rid of this bad mood. Or this bad mood is caused because somebody else uh, uh, didn't do something right and then offended me and upset me and it's your fault. And it gets very complicated as a person. But if I trust in the awareness, then that very sense of, you know, of not feeling good or feeling negative or feeling insecure confused or angry or upset by anything can be seen, can be recognized in terms of what it is. It is what it is. As soon as I say it's bad, then I'm that's adding more to it because I'm judging. Bad is a judgment from my critical mind. But if I trust in the awareness, then one, that awareness allows us to see the conditioned realities of this moment in terms of Dhamma. Sapei Sankarani Cha, all conditions are impermanent. Sapei Tama Anatta, all Dhamma is not my personal, not me as a person, not a self, not a soul. So the Buddha was pointing at this, this reality, this awakened attentiveness, paying attention, and getting beyond the critical faculty, which is based on cultural conditioning and moral conditioning and, and societal conditioning, all kinds of things, cultural ethical, all these things are, you know, are about the world, about 
conditioned phenomena. Some, you know, it has its conventional reality. Some things are better than others, and there's good, and something, you know, to do good and refrain from doing bad, and and uh, right and wrong. These are, this is about the conditioned realm. The conditioned realm has these extremes. It's dualistic. So good and bad, right and wrong, what should be, what shouldn't be. These these are the sangsara. There's refinement, refined uh, beauty, and there's gross ugliness, coarseness, vulgarity, horror, horror, and all the rest are you know, the various extremes of, of conditioned phenomena. <coughs> but to not be caught in that realm, if we're just caught in trying to sort out the conditioned world, you know, we're going to be disappointed because it's, it's for us to, for me to try to, to rearrange it all so it, it's what I like and what I think should be is, it's an impossibility. I can't do that. It's just not not a, you know the life is too short and and um, my personality is not equipped to to um, be God and um, do make everything the way I want it. So the. Um, Awareness, then, is the only way out of that. So awareness, pure subjectivity, is, is the gate to the deathless, where we, when we recognize that, then we're actually outside the time realm and the conditioned realm. And when you try to figure that out, then you're back into the thinking realm again. So you, you can't think it. You can't just figure it out like that. You've got to recognize it. Now this in reflection, like on this retreat, is reflect, you know, this awareness. It's not a created state. It's not, you know, like, like that I create this. I can create something into that. I can create myself. I can deliberately create myself as a person. I can think about my past, about my history, about all of my memories and and my uh, successes and failures and my hopes for the future and and old age and sickness, death and uh, all the rest. I can you know, be very critical. I can tell you how this country should be run and on the kind of sangha I want here at Amravati, the kind of monastic sangha I really desire personally, you know, where all the monks and nuns are content with the four requisites and grateful for the opportunity and where all the monks and nuns practice diligently night and day and where they all keep the rules very well and and live in harmony and uh, where you know they there's no kind of no one just you know dragging their feet or causing any trouble everybody's moving in step harmonious sangha and uh, that's how i would like it personally <coughs> As an ideal sangha, isn't it? An ideal of ideal monks, ideal nuns, ideal lay people, ideal monastery. But then this is the way it is. It's not an ideal. It's like this. And so the the uh, realities of here and now. This this uh, you know the the ideal monk and nun is not you know, is not, we're not, none of us are ideal monks or nuns. There's not one of us, including myself, that is an ideal monk or nun. 
but we are what we are. <laughs> so, uh, so it's it's when we live in a world of ideals, then we can only be dissatisfied and frustrated. But if we trust in uh, awareness, um, you know, this moment, then then the the uh, fears and desires and the the um, obsessions of the mind, the, 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 the energies of the body, the greed, hatred, and delusion, fear, desire, uh, the, the powers that affect us from the universe, the sun and the moon, the stars, the uh, weather, um, the seasons, the day, the night, all this is seen from awareness rather than from preference, personal preference. The different perspective, and it's, uh, is it, we call it transcending, doesn't mean reject. Transcend doesn't mean floating off away from, but it includes all this. Awareness brings us into this relationship to the conditioned realm, not on a personal level anymore, but through wisdom, through understanding it through just recognizing all conditioned phenomena like this. Whether it's good or bad or ideal or not or what we like or what we don't like, whatever it is, you know, whatever mood, whatever memory, whatever emotion, whatever thought, whatever sense experience, whether you're feeling healthy or sickly, weak or strong, or whatever, these these conditions are seen from the perspective of oh, satipanya or mindfulness wisdom. So then, they, they just by exploring that, the pure subject. And then you have to, you know, you can't find it. You just by letting go of, of the desire to find the pure subject, to know who you really are, just let go of everything and, and pay attention. When there's no self, this stillness, this emptiness, this silence, is not annihilation, is it? <coughs> From there, then, then this is the, like the life of the samana, the alms mendicant, is that we live on the risk basis, taking a risk, not having uh, wealth or property or things like this, living on the edge, on the, you know, just in faith. And then the, the needs, the requisites are provided seem to come in abundance. And, you know, it's not, you know, I've never had any real problem in all the years with, with uh, the basic requisites. So, you know, the monastic form, is a, it's an ancient form. It's something to really respect about yourself. This is a, you know, willing to, to take on this, this, uh, this life within this risk, this unknown, this depending on the goodness of others, on the kindness the generosity of others. You know, it goes against our whole conditioning. And then my, my conditioning was, was the total opposite of this. Was to be independent. I can take care of myself. I don't need others. Because I've, I've, I've got the wits and the ability to just take care of myself. And, 
and uh, be free from needing others. I don't want to need or be dependent. It's disgraceful, isn't it, to be dependent on somebody else. Assert yourself. Independence. Freedom. Was very much the attitude of my generation. The idealism. And then the, then the monastic life, here I find myself dependent. But that dependency is not because of uh, inability to take care of myself. It's chosen, isn't it? I've chosen to, to live in this way out of faith and recognizing the potential of this, you know, for developing what I really want, what I'm really determined to to understand and realize in this in this lifespan of this body. <coughs> and so uh, there's strong determination, you know, to to do that. And not to let anything get take me over, not to be overwhelmed by the the particular things that I experience. Now that takes strong determination. Because it, you know, it, uh, it, you know, to use everything, you know, the the praise you get, the blame you get, the successes, failures, the good times, the bad times, when everything's get going well, when everything's falling apart. You know, so like in the when people disrobe and things like that, isn't it? It, it. Things fall apart for a while. Everybody it seems to be everybody disrobing. I used to think sometimes a few years ago, see, uh, probably come in morning puja and there'll be nobody there but me. <laughs> what will I do then? <clears throat> so then these. Uh, and then the then the personal side comes in, you know, there's you know, on a personal level, isn't it, of wanting to to be considered successful monk, someone who's who's done a lot, brought the Dhamma here, established monasteries with a an upachai, a preceptor that's ordained a lot of men and women and guided them and into the right path and there's a lot of you know, that kind of thing that would arise, a feeling of failure, a feeling of success when it was going well, and a feeling of failure when it fell apart. Now the, the determination to look at that, the success and failure. So even failure is okay, you know, if it's another condition. And it's not, that's not the point, is is enlightenment or breaking through the realm of illusion doesn't depend on on other people or success in monastic life on a, on that level it it depends solely on the awareness you know so so it's it's you know the one you know the one on that level would like to see people having that determination and conviction and and a kind of commitment, sacrifice to stay through the through the valleys of despair, through the through the bad times, through the disillusionment. But one can only point to it. One can't, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a prison, but right? it's only it's a, that we have. And one's free to, to join or separate accordingly. <coughs> because it's not something that can be forced, is it? It's, it has to come from within you, a kind of really strong determinedness to, to not let the conditioned realm overwhelm you. 
So one needs to really know the conditioned realm, really study it. And that's what like Vipassana is all about, really studying and, and uh, you know, processing. Is there any condition, you know, no matter how subtle, refined, uh, evanescent, or how solid and, co and coarse and whatever uh, time span it has, whether it's brief or, or long, the, the witnessing to the anicca of conditioned phenomena. That which is aware of anicca, isn't it? That which is, is the awareness isn't anicca. Anicca arises and ceases, comes and goes. The conditioned world is never going to be satisfactory, you know. So never expect to find satisfaction in just being a monk or a nun or a monastic life or any monastery or any teacher or anything like that. It's just the you know, one has moments of inspiration and disillusionment and liking, disliking. But uh, it's never sat never be permanently satisfying. Because the conditioned realm, even at its best, is unsatisfactory. Now this is to be witnessed. How can it be satisfactory when it's always changing? <coughs> and it's beyond your control. You know, how can I control everything so that it pleases me all the time? And that's a tyranny. And if I kind of compelled you, you know, out of intimidation, to to just live your life to please me, make me feel safe and secure like a successful monk, great teacher, meditation master. You know, your duty here is to is to live your life for my benefit. That'd be a tyranny, wouldn't it? I'd become a tyrant. Eventually I'd end up like all tyrants. Hanging on the end of a rope, maybe. <laughs> So then in the, 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 the ambience of the samana life is a contentment and gratitude rather than idealism. And the, the requisites are, you know, when we chant or uh, reflect on the requisites, they're at the bottom of the ladder, you know, they aren't the best requisites. You know, so you, you know, I want the highest quality material for my robes and the best food, it's some whatever there, you know, alms food, cloth that's, uh, that's given and so forth. So that the, the, the contentment comes through, not, it doesn't mean that you try to make yourself content. That's some kind of ideal that you should be content if you're a summoner. But to be aware of discontentment of feeling discontented, of not, you know, you, know, what, you know, when you look at the food, what goes through your mind, of not to, as a criticism, but just recognizing. Not that I should be content with this food and then try to make yourself act content. That's not, that's not reflecting or using that uh, samanathanya with wisdom. It's merely trying to Fool yourself again, so you start thinking you're content, which is another delusion. But it comes through recognizing discontent and attachment to discontentedness, of feeling, you know, feeling discontented with the place you're living in or the 
the robe you're wearing or the food you're eating or the medicine that's available. This kind of grumbling, discontented, wanting better. You know, these are, from this position of pure subjectivity, awareness, See, be witnessing this discontentment. And by recognizing it as conditioned phenomena arising, ceasing. So it's not trying to, to make you, intimidate you and make you feel bad about being discontented, but it's, it's giving uh, something to reflect from not to, to try to become a contented person, because as a person you'll never be contented personally. But contentment comes through letting go of discontentment. And to let go of discontentment, you have to know what discontentment is. You have to recognize it. And, uh, and the, the gratitude, isn't it? The, the, these, these contentment, gratitude, are tremendous foundation for meditation. And that's what, you know, when I living with Lung Po Cha, I realized that's what the whole point of the monastic life was developing a, a very strong foundation for reflection. You know, if I'm just always discontented and trying to get something or control something, it's really hard to develop meditation in any serious way. It just makes you more manipulative, discontented, unless you can kind of control a situation the way you want it, or, you know, you just uh, struggle all the time. So, so then contentment and gratitude, is, you know, that's where, like, the jhana factors develop. Where, you know, the, the strength of the jhanas can come from that foundation, not from me trying to attain them as a, some kind of personal aspiration. They naturally come from, from contentment and gratitude from from here and now from being at ease with this moment so that that uh, the the joy of the life the goodness of the life is is recognized so the piti sukha ekagata come from that rather than from me trying to control the environment so that i makes me feel good or I create, you know, refined states that depend very much on, on me controlling the situation. Then, uh, then the, the the vipassana, the satipatthana, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness, that way of reflecting on the, the nature of things, the way things really are, the way it is until <coughs> there's no more uh, getting lost in, in identifying with the conditioned realm, no matter how subtle uh, or flickering those movements are in consciousness, because your strength isn't in, is no longer wavering in the, in the, by just being fascinated or repelled or that by the conditioned realm. Seeing ingratitude, you know, saying you should be grateful for all this is a, is a, you know, a, a, a very intimidating. If I say you should be grateful, because 
that sounds too personal, like you're somebody, a person that should be grateful for something. But gratitude is, it comes quite naturally when you reflect on the way it is, on the goodness of the life that we're living. And the, the uh, you know, just the, the opportunity that we have to, to live like this. And the, the kind of support and interest and willingness of, of the, the lay community and the eagerness to, to help us is, uh, you know, brings up my sense of katanyu, you know, the teacher the, towards the Buddha, towards Ajahn Chah, towards the Sangha, towards the lay people, the whole thing is, is based on reflection, not that I think I should be grateful for anything as on personally, but some, on a personal level, sometimes I'm not grateful. You know, I can be grumbling and complaining just like anyone else on a personal level. <coughs> but if I follow the, the personal, you know, uh, that I can see is a trap I no longer want to align myself, get caught into. As I studied it, you know, you, you explore, investigate that whole trap of the condition where you think conditioning affects your consciousness till you, you, you find nothing in it that you want to perpetuate anymore. And your trust is in the awareness An insight that comes from that. Because awareness is not a passive state. It's a very attentive, alert state. Discerning, intelligent. But it's not mine as a person. You know, it's, it's where we're one. You know, the personal drops away. You know, there's oneness. So out of that oneness and compassion, love and compassion come from that because it, we see what they call interconnectedness, interrelatedness, they, these are words of the time. <laughs> Globalization, <laughs> interconnectedness. And that, because we're not, you know, defining ourselves within the limits of nationality, gender, class, race, even religion. This is a, just a convention. Being Buddhist is merely a, a, a convention, expedient convention, but not an identity. So during this retreat, the, the last two weeks, uh, you know, like... The, it is a formal retreat, so I really appreciate when people make the effort to to abide within that structure because it is very supportive and and uh, you know the sense of sama ki or unity coming together, helping each other, supporting each other in our in spiritual endeavor. You know, rather than just doing our own thing all the time doing, you know, I don't feel like coming, so I won't come, or that kind of thing. But it really, even if we can feel like that, you know, I feel like that a lot too. Don't want to be bothered sometimes. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the reflection on that, like this, to a formal retreat, begin to recognize that, that, uh, the, you know, of this sense of sangha, supporting each other during this retreat, just by all, uh, you know, determining to follow the, the structure that is given, the, the, the discipline that is offered. And then the, our own tendencies to not want to do it, or be, well, those are things to be recognized. So the determination, say, to follow, to, to be a, participating member of this retreat in its formal aspect 
uh, make that a determination, and then to then to uh, be aware of the the resistance or uh, feelings one has pro or con in regards to it. So then, as a sangha, we're you know we're they have our oneness then is in the awareness. not in our position, <coughs> but in the awareness. And that awareness then is, 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 is the unitive reality. Which the personal dissolves in it, you know, it's not personal anymore. Then after the retreat, the formal retreat, then really, you know, then things start changing. Recognize that the 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 contrast when when the formalities, the the designated conventions, are no longer applicable. And then uh, I'll be going to Chithurst to stay for a year and things like this. Uh, the separation coming together these are the part of the flow of life you know but uh, and so it's not to you know to see how that affects to see how it affects you you know the separation people uh, coming people going things changing just the Awareness around the way it is, is 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 enough. You know, it's all that's necessary for liberation. And how it affects you, you know, whatever way it is. And, you know, so because the, you know, each one of us is has our karmic uh, predicament. You know, why aren't you all like me? Why? Why can't you be all like me? I used to wonder that. Why? Why do you people? Why are people so different? And uh, the only uh, decent explanation, acceptable explanation, is the karma, isn't it? Each one of us is has our karma to live with. The way we are, the way you know, the things affect this this uh, consciousness through this form is not going to be the same for everyone. So I offer this for reflection. Um, no.